know most people on here now. Um, it's been a year, almost a year of doing these kind of professional development events now, which is great. So um, uh, Casey and I are co-directors of GemMed Recruitment. So we specialize in recruiting um, in field and sales roles, particularly in the med tech space. <laughs> And we also are really passionate about raising professional development within the industry and also increasing awareness of the med tech industry for those actually not in it. And so we love running events like this. And we're really happy that this particular topic in terms of leadership obviously really resonated. And, you know, we've been having with chats with people who said they don't often get the opportunity to network between companies and talk about these sorts of um, topics so really appreciative of our three guest speakers today and thanks to everybody who's joined us i think this has been our biggest response yet for one of our webinars so thanks for the support um, just a few housekeeping things there isn't really any housekeeping other than um other than guest speakers if we can just keep the um microphones on mute uh we will be recording this there's a lot of people that wanted to attend but couldn't make it because of cases or you know whatever it might be so we'll be recording and sharing that if that's okay with everybody and we did send round um a form with and a lot of people have sent questions in so we'll probably ask some of those questions and if you anything burning comes up during the talk please just pop it in the chat box and we'll try to have some time at the end to ask the questions uh, so we've got three guest speakers today. We've got Richard Thwaite here from, and you're in New Zealand, aren't you? Hi everyone, sure am, sure hey, am. From Intelligent, and we'll, I'll do a bit of an intro on him in a minute. We have Caroline Atia from, um, who's head of HR at Colorplast. So thank you, Caroline, for joining us, and I'm glad the tech's working. Amen to that, thank you. <laughs> and we have Beth Roberts from Careless Martin up the top of my screen anyway with the map in the background so hey Beth. Hi everyone. Awesome so what we're going to do with the session's about an hour we'll try and stick to that um, about you know 15 to 20 minutes for each guest speaker with some time for a couple of questions and um, I'll just introduce each guest speaker as we go. I will read my notes um, because I don't want to miss out anything important or say anything wrong. So <laughs> if it's okay, we will start with Richard. Is that okay, Richard? Sure is. Awesome. So um, Richard Thwaite is the head of product for Talligent. So that's a company that offers psychometric testing. And really it's to provide, to provide analytically informed and bias-free solutions for identifying talents. Um, Richard has a background in psychology and statistics and is the perfect person to discuss data-driven decision-making and competency measurement. Um, he's kindly offered his time today to run through and share with us some of the key attributes that they look for um, in psychometric testing in terms of competencies of leaders and what a great psychometric profile looks like for a really good leader. Um, so we actually partner with Taligent and create specific psychometric tests that don't completely you know make a decision but they really help to guide decisions and and really help with development of people as well so welcome Richard. Thank you so much Tara it's great to be here um, so everyone I have got a few slides I will just share my screen um, so can everyone see that now yes Awesome, fantastic, great. Um, yeah, so so hi everyone. As as Tara said, my name is Richard. Um, psychometrics is a thing that I am very passionate about, and I work for an organisation which is you know we're intelligent, where we're really focused on using data to help people make better decisions in hiring. Um, so really, psychometrics has changed a lot. Um, in in the past, psychometrics was um, you know, you had your Myers-Briggs, you had your solving patterns, and that was kind of it. Um, and it was very much just focused on psychology and really people sitting down and doing pen and paper tests. Um, but that's changed a lot in, into the 21st century. So psychology, making sure that we are still predicting something, we're still understanding what behaviors are going to lead to good performance outcomes, still critical. Um, but in the world of today where 
everyone's got a phone, um, everyone's got a laptop, technology is a really key part. So being able to complete psychometric assessments on any device at any time is kind of a core part of the industry. Um, and then being able to use the data that's being gathered to improve decisions that are being made. So actually being able to not only collect data and store data, but then actually use that data to make better decisions is really important in the world that we live in. Um, and of course, doing that in a, uh, in a way that is, is fully digital and is fully immersive. Um, everyone today, we expect high quality digital experiences on, on whatever device we're on. So these are all aspects that make up um, psychometrics today and what we use to, to measure behaviors. So I'm, I'm not sure how many people in the room will have had experience with psychometrics in the past. Um, there's kind of a few key reasons that they're used. So really the, the, the first and foremost is bringing objectivity to what can often be a subjective process of recruitment. So psychometrics allow you to objectively measure capability. Um, and that really links into looking at not only performance, but also potential. So one of the analogies that I really like um, for hiring is, is that of an iceberg. You know, you see a lot when you bring someone into the room, um, you know, you see their skills and their experience, but what you actually get when you hire someone is, is very different. It's a lot more than that. Um, you, you see things that are going to really impact their performance down the line and, and what they're gonna be like in six months time. Things like their personality, their loyalty to the business, um, their cognitive ability. So that's kind of a, a great reason to use psychometrics is that double pronged approach of performance and potential. Um, and also the immediate fit. So how, how someone fits, not only within the role that they're in, um, but the team within the company and the business overall. Um, you know, we really see psychometrics being used effectively to guide a lot of these things. Um, in terms of the practical applications of psychometrics, we see them used really effectively throughout the employee life cycle. Um, so it's not a, as, as Tara mentioned, it's it's not a, a magic bullet. You know, it's not something that is just plugged in and then that's going to spit out all the information that you could ever need about someone. But they're really valuable tools to add objective data. Um, so be that in the sourcing phase where you're really wanting to make sure you've got the, the a quantity of candidates and a quantity of people coming into a pipeline. Um, acquisition phase where you're understanding or where employees employers are understanding the quality of their um, of their applicants and unfortunately in today's world um, with higher levels of unemployment that's a really crucial stage in making sure that you can identify strengths of someone um, uh, on 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 mass um, looking beyond just their CV or just an interview um, and then also in the post hire space as well so being able to not only use psychometrics to to bring people into the organization but then once they're in the organization making sure that they're really um, fulfilling their potential and you're you're helping them to fulfill their their potential um, and like any tool it needs to be used in the right place of this journey um, to be giving those those really effective results because it is really a science you know it really does um, does come from a, a scientific place and a scientific background. So when we're talking about um, how these are being used within, uh, within the recruitment process, it's really how strengths and how performance are measured effectively. Um, and the first step of that is with any role um, is to make sure that the, uh, you understand what good looks like. Um, so that when, uh, when you're going through psychometrics as a candidate, um, as a potential job seeker, or when you're using psychometrics as an employer, um, you understand what you're actually looking for. So the first step is something called success profiling, which takes um, a number of data sources and combines them all together. And then from there, building out the assessment itself. So do you, need, do you have a role that has um, you know, a strong cognitive element? Someone needs to be very good with verbal information uh, or do they just need to be able to use, use, an Excel, use Excel effectively, making sure that whatever you, are, you need for the role, you're designing into the test. Um, and then really the third stage of that is what we call validation. Um, now this is when, when the assessment or when the, the battery of assessments has been used for a while um, to hire people. 
actually closing the loop and saying, well, all these things that we identified up here in step number one, are they linking to top performers and are people who are scoring better on this test doing better on the job and really making sure that we're, um, we're doing everything we said we would. <laughs> um, and from, from this, this rigorous scientific process, a lot of different outputs, a lot of different ways that this data can be used. Um, and I'll share a bit more, a couple of examples of these uh, a little bit later on. Um, and these are all, you know, psychometrics is becoming more and more important um, because, you know, we are seeing the vast majority of long-term success is people skills. So it's your soft skills. It's not necessarily what you know, um, but it's how you're interacting with, with your teams and with everyone around you. And I, I, I don't have the evidence to, um, to support this point, but I would imagine that that only grows um, when you're looking at leadership. So when you when the more the higher up you are in organi organization, the more leadership skills um, or responsibilities rather that you have, the more your success is going to depend on those people skills. Um, and so some of those kind of key attributes here um, are are on this slide. So this comes from our own work in success profiling, looking at a number of leadership roles, looking at specifically with the sales lens um, and saying, well, what does good look like in these roles? And some of these behaviors um, are common uh, in, in kind of your, your, your roles before you get to a leadership position. So the likes of having a strong achievement focus and being organized and being resilient, these are all things that are gonna relate to um, good performance outcomes. But the further up, the further you, you kind of move up the leadership ladder, um, the more you'll need the, the more interpersonal competencies and the leading competencies. So how effectively you can manage talent, you can manage your team. Um, negotiation, we all know that strong sales performers are, are very good at negotiation, um, but that becomes really important as, you, as you're in a leadership role as well not only negotiation um, externally but also internally between functions um, and then you know your, your ability to build strong relationships both within your team and outside your team to to help you to really succeed um, so these are these are kind of the the competencies that we've outlined from a sales leadership perspective um, and there are also other competencies which really fit into a a leadership group um, so we've touched on managing talent and negotiation, but depending on the, um, the flavor of the leadership role, there are other, other elements that you bring in here. So your, your strategic um, big picture thinking and your directing action. Um, now, that's not to say that these competencies aren't important. These attributes aren't important for sales leadership, um, but it's these eight that really do most of the heavy lifting when it comes to performance in, in sales leadership roles. Um, now I mentioned as well the you know this the scientific process we're going through looking at what comes out the other end um, so there are some you know leadership is is especially cognizant for everyone in this in this call um, and what you're able to do with psychometrics is actually identify potential of a leader um, before they even get into your organization before they're even on your payroll and that can really help when you're looking at um, selecting people and bringing people in to say well this person looks great now um, and might be better than than someone else but this the second person they might have a really strong leadership potential so maybe we might take a chance on a few of these areas for development and have the trade-off for that leadership growth um, because anyone who's been involved in hiring will know that no candidate is perfect. Um, and so this, this data allows you to make those educated trade-offs and guide your decision-making. Um, and another aspect that becomes really crucial as a, as a leader is emotional intelligence. So not only having the skills yourself, um, but also being able to, to build off other people um, to create relationships with, between other functions. Maybe you work really closely with marketing or support or operations in your role and actually having the emotional intelligence to um, be able to achieve goals through other members of your team is really critical. Um, so definitely a, a way to develop that, um, sorry, a way to succeed rather is to develop that emotional intelligence. And on the topic of developing, um, a few tips that you know are probably really really valuable for for many of you on this call in terms of what can you do to develop these behaviors on an ongoing basis uh, we all know that 
you know, behavioral change doesn't happen overnight. You know, it really is a, um, it's a long-term endeavor towards improving your instincts, not just your, not just ticking a box. Um, so some of these that are really, some strategies that are really effective, um, developing a, a, a strong sense of radical candor. So the way to do that is through mentorship. So finding a mentor who you can have a, a good level of psychological safety with, and you can actually um, receive feedback and take that on board. Um, the second being having a having a growth mindset, so continuous um, continuous learning. So not just um, you know not just learning, um, not having learning stop at a certain point, but actually continuing to read widely, attend webinars, um, online courses. That's going to be really effective for developing out these competencies. Um, feedback. So getting feedback from within your team, so your manager, your peers, your direct reports, possibly even clients. Um, if, you're, if you're a bit more of a client-facing leader, that can really help um, to kind of iron out and smooth out some of those blind spots that you might not even be aware of. Um, and the fourth point is empathy with your team and with employees. Um, there's, a, there's a real concept of, of servant leadership in the agile space at the moment. And that's really where you're flipping the, the norm of leadership on its head and, and not thinking, well, what can my employees do for me? But actually, how can I improve their, uh, their job and make their lives easier, increase their engagement, and ultimately be a really successful leader um, through driving the success of your team? Great. Um, well, that's you know, they're, 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 that's a short kind of slide deck that I'd, I'd put together for everyone. Um, are there any questions? Richard, thank you so much for that. That was yeah. very insightful, and I know we've we've um, gained a lot from doing these reports on our candidates even before we submit them for um, you know in a short list to our clients. Yeah. And definitely, I think that emotional intelligence and leadership is. Obviously, it's a buzzword, but it's, you know, something that comes up a lot and is very important. Um, maybe you could just touch a little bit on the, um, you know, the couple of reports that we use with you, like a little bit around that leadership report and what it shows, and then a bit about the emotional intelligence. And also a question that comes up a lot um, from our clients and, and people have submitted this question is, can people learn emotional intelligence mm. and can they develop more emotional intelligence? Definitely, definitely. So uh, in terms of the reports, the way that you know, they're really effective is it breaks down what leadership is into six underlying competencies. So I'm not sure how effectively that'll come through on the screen, but really looking at um, how you're, you're solving problems and you're, um, you've got a growth mindset and self-management. So really looking at um, using those to, to make decisions and having your overall leadership score coming through strongly um and yeah you know emotional talent intelligence is the same so one of the one of the great aspects of of um what outputs you can get from these reports is that development mindset so looking and saying well um in in emotional intelligence for example there are two kind of internal facing competencies so looking at your your self-awareness and your self-management and then also two external facing competencies so how aware you are of of others and how you manage relationships with others um, and you're actually able to get tips and um and tricks that kind of come out of the report and help you in a behavioral way to improve some of these scores and that's really where we see the most um uh, you know the most success with developing competencies which is it is difficult it's not an overnight thing but you can definitely develop these competencies um, by kind of taking on good behavioral examples so that's where that radical candor especially comes into comes into play if you've got a mentor um, who can really give you good examples of what you've done right and what you haven't done quite so well that can help you to build that um, and and really develop that competency over time so yes, definitely not a, not personality isn't fixed. Definitely something that is, um, is changeable and malleable. Awesome. Thank you so much, Richard. Look, I am conscious of time, so I will keep moving on. And if there is some time at the end for questions, great. And if not, please, anybody feel free to um, email afterwards as well. If there's any questions at all, we can kind of so, share the, share contacts and things. So thank you, thank you Richard. And please, if you've got any questions, just pop them in the chat box. Um, okay, so I'm gonna move on to Caroline Atia. Hi, Caroline. 
Hi, Tara. How are you? <laughs> good. How are you? You're really good. Thank you. Good. So, Caroline, I'm just going to introduce you. So, Caroline is the head of HR for Colorplast, and you've been adding value in that role for over 12 months now. Um, but you have significant prior human resources experience across multiple other organizations, both within healthcare, um, but also within the banking and automotive industry. And in, in addition to your HR business and psychology credentials, you're also accredited as an executive coach. So you actually work with many senior leaders and executives, and you've got a real passion for sharing your knowledge of HR issues, leadership and development. And look, if people aren't already following people, um, Caroline on, on LinkedIn, you're really, um, you, you do a lot on there and you're really active on um, LinkedIn and, and you definitely share some really awesome contact that, content that's very relevant for our industry. So Caroline's yeah. kindly offered, to, um, offered her time to share your personal leadership journey and your leadership philosophies and how you assess and develop as part of your kind of coaching and your um, leadership skills in others. Good stuff, thank you. How's my sound quality wise? Really good. I don't know good. how you're managing that, but it's great. <laughs> we'll take it for now. Fingers crossed it stays this way. Now it is hard to sort of follow through after Richard, he's got some really fancy slides and unfortunately I don't have any slides, but hopefully my content makes up for the lack of slides. So look, I'm really thrilled to be here and thank you for the invitation, Tara and Casey, of course, as well. I want to really talk about, I suppose, my experience from a HR perspective, but also talk about some of the experiences also in terms of the things that we look out for from a leadership perspective. So yes, the intro is done. I don't need to probably introduce myself as much, but yes, I work for uh, Coloplast, who are a market leader in the medical devices industry, in particular within sort of chronic care and the ostomy, uh, continence and wound care. Uh, industries in particular or markets in particular. So I wanted to start off with first about sort of my background and what brings me here today. So if I look at the different industries that I've worked in, you know, I've, I've worked in automotive, banking, manufacturing, and also obviously recently within public health for a number of years as well. You know, and I often get asked, you know, you've worked in many different industries. What's the difference from a HR perspective? And, and in all honesty, I can say hand on heart, the core HR role, although the industry is different, the people that you might be dealing with are different. The core HR role is fairly similar uh, from, a, I suppose, from that perspective. But what's changed for me personally between those roles and, and really over the years has been obviously my growth and my own develop, development, as well as really my understanding of the, the role of HR and the function of HR and what value HR adds. So if I look back at my early years within HR, you know, HR, as I knew, it was very tactical and really an operational role. You know, we had our people cycle. We sort of, um, we'd look at how we can best embed that into the businesses. And sometimes, you know, sadly, we'd also be forcing it on, into businesses without really looking at that bigger picture, you know, of how does the work that we do from a HR perspective really add value to the business ultimately. So over the years, you know, I've learned how I can become more effective and impactful. As, as a HR leader within my particular field. You know, I think I've learned that in order for, for me to be successful or for a HR leader to be successful in, in, in their role or for any leader within any function to be successful, you need to take on the role of a business leader first before you become a HR leader. So let me tell you what I mean by that. So there's, there's a real need for us as leaders to understand the business first, really immerse ourselves into the business, look at what the direction is, what's the short-term strategy, what's the long-term strategy for the business, and then look at how can HR or your function, whether it be finance, logistics, whatever the function is, then look at how can HR add value and how can HR complement whatever that business strategy is and the direction. And how can you, within your capacity as a function leader, help the organization achieve its goals versus the siloed HR view that, you know, that exists within other businesses still that we see, unfortunately. Um, and then it's not you forcing an agenda on the business. It's actually saying, okay, so here's the value that we can add and here's how we can do it. And it's, it's it, the, from a buy-in perspective, you're, you're obviously getting that, uh, you're, you're a lot more successful and you're seen as a partner versus a detractor. And that's, I think, one thing I'd say as a general rule is regardless of what function you head, let's 
take off our function hats and let's look at what the business and let's be business leaders first before we are function leaders. You know, over the years, because of the nature of my role, I've worked really closely with many leaders and managers at different levels. You know, I've seen leaders lead their teams to some really incredible heights and achieve some really great successes, but at the same time, still maintaining a really cohesive team with, with really positive team dynamic. But sadly, I've also seen the opposite, you know, where there's managers who are really destructive in how they operate and how they're, you know, from an output perspective and simply just even within their team dynamics, you can really see a difference between a high performing team and, and the manager versus a team that is destructive or toxic even. And then you tend to look at what role the leader plays in both these teams and it often points to that to what role the leader has played in really setting that culture within the team and setting the tone as to what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. So what I've learned really is, it comes down ultimately to key traits and characteristics. So I think Richard alluded to some of those competencies and it really is that it's not, it's not about how technically strong you are. It comes down to the behaviors and the competencies that you demonstrate within this role as, as a leader and not how strong you are. You know, and, and that's where my, my interest really sparked, you know, looking at the, the leadership and leadership development uh, and the difference a leader can make to an individual, whether it be from a work perspective, but also the impact it has on an individual from a, a personal satisfaction also, and then the, uh, the effects on the roll on effects of that too. So leadership and leadership development evolved to become a real passion of mine. You know, I took that, uh, I then took that curiosity and passion and, and did some further training and uh, I became a qualified executive coach. You know, I've had the pleasure over the years again to work with, uh, with many different leaders uh, to look at really understanding who they are a little bit better and help them understand who they are, but also help them, you know, look at what are their stumbling blocks, what really holds them back from being really effective and then helping them become even more stronger leaders. So before I talk about the traits of what really makes a good leader, and I'll talk about some of the traits that I've observed over the years, I want to do a really quick activity, and Tara, I might need your help with this. So what I want you to do is if you have a look in the chat box section, um, I'd like you to share your responses to this. So take maybe the next 10, 15 seconds, have a bit of a reflection and think of a manager that you've worked for, someone who you would define as a good leader. You know, I want you to think back and specifically tell me what traits are they demonstrating and what qualifies or what makes them good. I'll give you 10 seconds. If you can just put in your comments in the, uh, in the chat section, that'd be great. Approachable, easy to talk to and helpful. There's trust, inspirational, they care about me honest, empathy, these are really great comments, supportive, can't keep up, there's so many, but they're all really good, <laughs> constructive feedback, absolutely, accept responsibility, has empathy, yeah, spot on, when they say they'll deliver, when, the, when they deliver, what they deliver, when they say they'll deliver it, absolutely, reliability, nice, Thank you. These are really good comments and really good perspective. And you can actually see some themes there, can't you, as well? So on the flip side now, let's just take again another 10, 15 seconds. Reflect on the opposite. So a manager who you've had, um, or maybe someone that if, you, if you've been blessed to not have had a bad manager, great. But maybe reflect on someone that you might have observed without mentioning names, please, or business names. Talk to me about what traits are you seeing? And again, what behaviors are you looking at? Support communication? Yes, definitely. What else? Secretive, process focused, not people focused, dismissive, not trusting. Accountability, absolutely. Demeaning. You like that one, don't encourage others to fly. Lack of interest. Okay. Interesting, self-serving. Some really interesting comments there. And again, you can see, although they're different, micromanaging, yes, definitely. Just interested in teaching, 
some really good comments. Thanks, guys. Really great to kind of see that there's some really clear themes there, but also really what's interesting is that we are, as individuals, we are so clear on what we see are good behavioral traits, but also what are poor behavioral traits is really interesting. You know, but there's, although there's different, there's themes that we're seeing, um, there's, I mean, we describe them differently, which is really interesting, but the reality is we're humans and we have core needs. And that's why you'll see that there's a lot of real similarities that we see in the descriptions and some things that we, and the behaviors that we see that we like and what we don't like because of those similarities in, in who we are and our core needs. So although these needs might look different, they're still similar at the core. So let's talk about what is leadership. So there's this uh, interesting misconception I see that's really evolved um, over the years that to be a leader, you need to somehow be someone else. You step into this other persona, take on certain traits, you need to speak a certain way, behave a certain way, and be someone else who you're truly not. And that's not authentic leadership. And, and I'm thankful there's a, there's a lot more education around what that is these days because that is not what leadership is. The definition of leadership, thankfully, has evolved over the years. And although we see many different styles, you know, we've gone from in the 40s, 50s, command and control, and you achieve things through authority and power, through to a very different focus now where, you know, we talk about leaders as coaches who empower. We're starting to use, and I love this, we're starting to use words such as compassion, kindness, empowerment, heart. You know, and, and in the past, we laugh because in the past, these words would have been deemed as fluffy where they would have been frowned upon because they're not corporate enough. But we're seeing them a whole lot more in businesses and, and we see them as, as becoming the norm. If you don't operate this way, then you might be frowned upon or you might be seen as someone who is not an empathetic leader. So it's, been, it's, it's really great to see that shift from that dictator style or the authoritarian style to this real coaching style, which I think is, is a lot more effective from a leadership perspective. I think the reality is in my view, the, def the definition of a leader is really simple. It's, it's someone who has followers and followership in any role. You don't need any title, you don't need any authority to become a leader of sorts. If you have followership, if you can have an impact on those around you, a positive impact on those around you, if you can set direction, if people look to you in a positive light, you're a leader. I think it's as simple as that. And I think we need to start changing that mindset of, I become a leader, therefore I have authority, therefore I've got a fancy title and therefore I am a leader. We've got to change that misconception. Yeah, yeah. If you do not have followership as a leader, then you're not a leader. It's as simple as that. You are a manager. You've got P&L responsibility, which is obviously a needed role. But to be beyond a manager and be a leader, you need to inspire. You need to really have an impact on people around you. You know, leadership is the ability to be able to translate vision into reality. You have these really high level visions that we see as businesses, how do I then cascade them down to my team in a way where I engage their minds and their hearts? You know, and I use the word hearts here very intentionally because I mean, you can have a lot of success uh, when you engage someone at a mind level, but you engage someone at a heart and a mind level and they're operating at a very different level internally. It moves from an external desire to succeed to really, it becomes an intrinsic desire you want to achieve that goal because it aligns with yours. There becomes this real alignment between my values and the organizations. There's this real, your purpose aligns with mine and therefore it's not seen as a job. It's seen as me doing it because I love what I do. And if you can really shift as a leader, if you are able to influence and really be able to um, engage someone's heart and mind, then that's, that's a really powerful ability and a powerful skill that you could take on, of course, and, and really it's, it's, it's most impactful. And then of course, the simple thing that we, you know, we see, and I think we expect from our leaders, and, and a few of you mentioned that too, as a leader provides clarity, direction, and then of course, empowers those around them to achieve. So I'll share with you from my view, you know, some of those traits and characteristics that I've seen over the years that I think are really important. But I've also really, I mean, there's many, many, many that we can go through, and I'm sure yeah, Richard yeah. can vouch for that. But if I look at just the top five that I think are most relevant now in this day and age, um, I'll share those with you now. We'll, we'll go through those. So the first one is around clarity. So clarity is, you know, they're, they're clear communicators, they're clear, they're concise at all times. 
there's no question on their vision and what needs to be accomplished. You know, they're decisive. You know exactly what you need to be doing. They communicate transparently and openly, and that really builds trust. And a few of you talked about trust. I think trust and having that ability to be uh, safe to raise, uh, to, to talk about things and be who you are without that fear of judgment or fear of that communication going elsewhere or that communication being held against you is powerful. So clarity, being clear and concise and being open and transparent in how you communicate and how you deal with your, with your team is a really important one. The second one, which I think is, which I feel is really powerful and I've seen that done really successfully is being able to empower and sponsor. So what I mean by that is, yes, you set the direction and the strategy as a leader, but then you work with the team on how will we get there? So our goal is this, let's allow work to, let's not, let's allow really not, not this out and talk about how will we get there as a team? What's really important for us and what role will we play in? And let's actually plan this out together. Therefore, I'm empowering my team and they're actually working towards achieving that roadmap. Um, that they've created themselves and therefore there's a whole lot more buy-in as well and you're empowering them and, and helping them grow in the process. But also when you empower and sponsor, you focus on growing and challenging your team through that process. You know, you hold them accountable. You, if there's an opportunity for say to sponsor um, an employee by, I don't know, there's a, there's a promotion or there's a, a training uh, course that's coming up or if there is a, um, a mentorship that you think your employee could benefit from. You're, you're their sponsor. You're out there really advocating for your team. So empower and sponsor is the second one. The third one, which is really, really relevant for this day and age is courage. You know, and I think uh, in this day and age, if you want to stay relevant, knowing how quickly the world moves and, and how quickly businesses move, you need to be prepared to take risks. And you need to be prepared to make some really courageous decisions. You know, within, within Coloplast, within our executive team, we often talk about being bold and we, we talk about that quite a fair bit. And I'm confident this is why we've had double digit growth in the last four to five years, including this year. And we've really confidently outgrown the market. And that's because we're constantly challenging ourselves. and We're taking some really risky decisions, but also just being really bold in, in our thinking. You need, the, you need courage to be able to voice those unpopular decisions. You know, you stand up for what you believe and stand up for what you feel the team can do as well. Um, and that might be challenging decisions upwards. That's a really important skill to be able to acquire as, as a leader. Courage to hold yourself and your team accountable. And that can equally mean really being able to call out behaviors that are not conducive to the team or aren't constructive and aren't going to help your team build or could impact the dynamic within your team. That's also courage. So that's three. So that's courage. If I look at four, four is around EQ. I know Richard talked about that quite a fair bit, but EQ is so important. That's EQ is emotional intelligence. That's your self-awareness. Are you able to adjust your behavior and your response? Are you able to customize the way you communicate and customize the way you operate? Do you know when you need to push forward versus really back off and let your team deal with things? Are you um, someone who can customize the way you communicate with your team to really get the best out of each of those individuals within your team? That's what EQ is, and that's that self-awareness where you're open to getting that feedback to and hearing that feedback to and knowing when there's things that you could be doing differently to achieve better results. Lastly, but definitely not least, it's humility. You've got to be humble enough to know that you're no expert. And I say that quite often within, within the executive team and within our team in general. We are not experts. We've got, we, we, in order for us to succeed, we need our team. And I think that's, if, if, any, if any leader or any manager walks into the role without that understanding, then they're, they're doomed or they're not going to have the success that we, we'd like to see them succeed or, or achieve. You know, when you make a mistake, don't, there's no shame in apologizing for it. You've got to be humble enough to know that you're always learning and need your team to succeed. And, that, and that's humility. So those are those five. I'll repeat them again. So there's clarity, empowering and sponsoring, courage, emotional intelligence, and lastly, humility. That's, so, oh, sorry to interrupt. That's awesome, Caroline. I just wanted to, um, you know, in the interest of time, I think everybody's hanging on every word. So I just want to make sure that there's um, time to ask questions and that sort of thing sure. as well. Give me two more minutes. I'll be wrapping up in a couple of minutes. Oh, Quickly, what do I look for to assess leadership potential? So there's a, there's a few things that I look for. Um, but across, I think, over the years, what's been really proven to be uh, 
measures of success are learning agility. So just because you're a high performer doesn't mean that you're someone who is a high potential. You know, so we've got to be able to understand what is someone's potential at the next level. Because the worst thing you can do is promote someone who is highly technical into a leadership position or into the next role. And then you prom promote them to a level of incompetence. So you've got to be really tangi understand tangibly what does their current ability mean, but also what their potential equals as well and how you can support both of those. The second one is their emotional intelligence. Do they have that currently? Do they have that self-awareness? Do they have that ability to adjust and, and really be um, able to um, go out there and seek that feedback and adjust how they operate? And lastly, but not least as well, is their ability and willingness. So you might have someone who is very strong technically and they've got that ability, or they might have exhibited some, some um, leadership traits as well. But do they have the genuine desire to be able, or that willingness to be able to step up into, into, into that next level role? So you've got to really assess that and make sure that you do have the right people for the right role. So you're setting them up for success ultimately uh, versus really uh, setting them up for failure. So in summary, uh, you know, I, I view being in leadership as a, as a, as a real privilege. I think the, the fact that we get to make such a significant impact on individuals and it, within our team, professionally and personally, is, is a real privilege and we should never forget that. I think that's, that's a really important message for us as leaders and for those who are keen to move into a leadership role, move in with that mindset as well would be my advice. Caroline, thank you so much. I mean, you're clearly so passionate and a real expert in this space. And I think for me, and I'm sure there's so many questions and things that will maybe push to the end, you know, mindful of time, but you know, that connecting to somebody's mind as well as their heart and some, all of a sudden a job becoming not a job anymore. It's a passion and it's a purpose and there's a real connectivity. So there's just so much that resonated there and I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions and even post if you're happy for us to connect you with some of the audience and people follow you on LinkedIn too. I think there'll be a lot of, um, you know, questions and advice people would like to seek from you. So thank you ever so much, Caroline. My pleasure. Thank you. Perfect. So Beth, <laughs> you've been waiting patiently. <laughs> so I'd like to introduce um, Beth Roberts. So Beth is the managing director of currently of KLS Martin. So you've got significant commercial experience in the med tech industry. And you've really grown up, I think, in the med tech industry, haven't you? And you've held um, previously held senior management roles in companies such as Wright Medical, Lima Orthopedics, Hillram, and, and you're really known by those who've worked with you as a passionate servant leader. And I think Richard mentioned this, you know, very kind of particular style of servant leadership in his, um, your talk. And thanks Beth for offering your time today to share, you know, your career journey, but really your passion and purpose within the industry and, and you know, how you've developed over time. So I'm gonna ask you a few questions and there were also questions put to us um, over the last few weeks from our audience. And it's just great to have a, an opportunity to have some kind of raw, authentic discussion. So can you talk to us a bit about your career journey? And we've got a mix of people on here from you know, senior leaders through to people that are currently leading without a title and, and really kind of inspired by people like you. So you know, talk to us about the kind of why behind your career history and what's your purpose and what are you passionate about? So uh, thanks, Casey and uh, Tara, for the opportunity. And hello to everyone I know, and hello to you, those of you I don't know. I look forward to getting to know you. And probably you'll know a little bit more about me by the end of this. Um, I just wanted to say one feeling that you may experience as a leader is imposter syndrome at any point. And I'll just tell you, there is a little bit of that going on this evening. So I'm kind of wondering why I'm here, but I'll give it my best go. So. Um, the why behind what I do, um, I fell into medical devices. I actually recruited myself into my first job. Um, so I had no idea these jobs existed and I read the, read the brief and thought, wow, I really need to do this. So I got into it and it really was everything that I hoped it would be and probably some more. Um, and I go and I try and remember this, the further I get from sales and the more you climb the ladder, I think it's really important never to lose sight of why you first got into this and how it made you feel. So um, 
my first job was in spine and I'll never forget really early on we did a case and we um, we did a spinal fusion on a young lady who was a quadriplegic and her spinal fusion was so that she could sit upright in a wheelchair and that really resonated with me as to actually I could be part of a team that really made a genuine difference to someone's life so it can sound corny and when you're interviewing people and you say you know why do you want to do this and they say I want to make a difference to people's lives and you might sit there and go yeah yeah actually if you think about it that's probably what we all want to do and and to be part of a team that actually does that um, I really really found that very fulfilling um, so whenever it gets a little bit dark and lonely I kind of throw myself back to when I was a sales rep and you know get dusting myself off and going into battle and you know and doing why I doing what I did and, and why I did it so and I think it was be, it was a tangible feeling to be part of a team and playing such an important role in that environment and um you know, there's no better adrenaline rush than when you, the lowly sales rep, you've maybe got a degree, maybe you haven't. And, you know, it's all going horribly wrong and it's going to custard. And they look at you and you actually know the answer and you can bail them out. And, you you know, your chest puffs out and there it is. You've got a great result for the patient and you think, oh, go me. I never knew I did it. So, um for me, that was something tangible that I could go home and feel good about and get that little adrenaline rush um, and just generally know, you, you know, you can make a difference. And that surgeon is relying on you to do your part in that procedure. Um, and if you don't, you know, if you don't check your kit beforehand and you're missing something that you need or you don't know what you're doing and it comes to crunch time and you can't answer their question and help them, then, you know, that's you not doing your job very well. So. Um, it was really awesome to, you know, to have that experience. So as I say, that's the why that did it. And then I will also be very honest and say, working in medical devices can give you a really nice lifestyle. You know, um, as Tara alluded to, I did grow up in medical devices. And for those of us who've obviously been around the block a few times, you know, there were the heady days when, you know, probably there was not this lovely compliance environment that work, we work in these days. And there was probably more expensive wine that we drank and swankier restaurants that we went to. But saying that, you know, if you work hard, you can, you can earn well and you can build a really nice lifestyle. So not only can you get the good feeling about helping people but you know on top of that you get paid well so you know what a double whammy so um that's probably my why and that's what keeps me going um what am i passionate about um trying to do the best job that i can do realizing i'm not perfect i'll i'll give it a red hot go i'll make mistakes um and you know but at the end of the day am i making a difference to people and am i doing you know am i doing the best job that i can do so that's really what i'm passionate about um yeah and i love that beth and i think you know leading back to what you know caroline was saying and of that that humility and vulnerability and you you coming across as you know i don't know everything but i'm here to kind of help and make a difference would be very inspirational i'm sure to the people that you've led so just talk to us a bit about your leadership style and, you know, really also how you develop skills over the years, moving from a sales role into the role that you have now. Caroline made a good point, uh, you know, start leading before you actually are a leader. Um, try it on for size, see whether you like it, see whether people see whether people want to come on that journey with you. You know, can you win hearts and minds without having that title, without having the stick to wave? You know, um, and if you can and you enjoy that, then absolutely go for it. Um, had no formal training, and those of you who know on the call will probably vouch for that. Um, but you know, I watched from my first job. What did I like about my boss? And Caroline asked us, "What did a good boss do? What did a bad boss do?" I remember, you know, still to this day, I just think, "Oof, there's certainly, you know, I can hark back and I could do names and, and and companies, but I think, you know, I just look at that and go, "Ooh, no, that's something I never want to be or something I never want to do." So, um, I observed a lot, and um, I also thought, "Okay, that works. That doesn't work." And then, how would I want? How would I want to be treated? What makes me 
that, you know, what motivates me? So if that can motivate me, can I then use that to help motivate people in the future? So, you know, again, treat people as you want to be treated. Um, I think, you know, if you, if you go with that in mind, the chances of really going and, you know, destroying something is, is, is limited. Um, I think recognize what motivates people, you know, reward and recognition. We go into this business for, for a reason. Um, and, you know, often reward and recognition is very high for us and understand what does that mean for different people? Because reward and recognition, are two words that resonate, but what does that mean for you and your team members? So um, I think, you know, how did I develop leadership? Trial and error. I tried it on for size. I got given opportunities and I took them, you know, so sometimes you might not think you're ready and an opportunity comes across your desk, grab it and have a go. Because if you've got a support network around you, you you'll go well. Um, so definitely trial and error. Um, I think lead by example, um, build your network. And um, Caroline and Richard very much talked on this. You know, radical candor is something that I'm learning a huge amount about, you know, very recently. But have your network. Um, I was saying to Casey and Tara earlier, the higher you go, and some wise person once said to me, it can be lonely at the top there. And I thought, yeah, 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 you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, the higher you go, the re you realize that it's you and you're out there fighting the good fight on your own. And sometimes you really need people to bounce ideas off and, you know, uh, try, th try things, you know, uh, have conversations that, you know, your network will say, you know, leave that alone, you know, walk well away from that. So definitely build your network, have mentors, have people in your network that you can have those robust conversations with that can guide you. Maybe they've been there and done that one and, and can say, well, you, you know, this is going to be interesting, strap yourselves in. So um, that's probably how I developed leadership. And, and I probably still don't think of myself as a leader. Um, I just think, you know, I've been really fortunate. I've got into positions and, um, you know, and, and things have worked in the vast majority. So I probably think be authentic and take people on the journey with you. Don't ask them, don't ask anyone to do something that you wouldn't go and do yourself. Um, because why would you? So, and I think, yeah, Caroline, you were really right. Win hearts and minds because, you know, no one wants to come on a journey with you if they don't believe you. So um, that's really what I've done. And again, it's so interesting listening to the kind of attributes that both Richard and Caroline have spoken about and then you literally demonstrating them right there and then with the humility really and, and that kind of, you know, learning agility that you're always open to continually learn and improve. And I think, you know, from that, and if you're comfortable, Beth, like, you know, we have got a lot of people on here. I know you've worked with people before, but, you know, if you're comfortable maybe sharing, you know, anything that you like a mistake you feel like you've made on your leadership journey and really how you learn from that and recovered from it too because like you're saying we're not perfect and we're continually learning oh well, there's plenty and um probably most of them i really shouldn't talk about on this call um but <laughs> one thing i'd say is i've definitely made plenty of mistakes um what own them own your mistake it's not anyone else's fault it's yours so you have to take accountability for it you have to um fail fast learn quickly and get back out there and you know and never make that mistake again so if you if you make a mistake that's fine just learn and don't make it again so um you know that's probably the thing that I always try and keep in my mind when the sky's falling in and I've, you know I've messed up and I think this is it you know my career is over then um I just think okay I won't I'll not do that again and I'll learn from it so um you know talk about authentic leader um in my first six months in my first job I um I managed to we were on conference I thought it was brilliant. I got completely carried away, very overexcited, stayed up all night partying with my roommates and my teammates, um, completely overslept the next morning, missed <laughs> breakfast, got frog marched along the lake of somewhere in Europe and 
I thought I was going to lose my job. And so it was probably one of the most stressful um, incidents I've ever had. Um, but you know what? I learned from it and I learned that, okay, if I want a little bit of a drink in the party, I'm going to set two alarms um, <laughs> and then I'll be at the chairman's breakfast every year after that. So that was, that was my um, hard awakening into medical devices. Um, and then from a serious point of view in leadership, there's plenty to choose from. Um, but probably one that niggles me the most is I allowed a negative individual to stay in their position longer than I should have. And we talked about being bold and brave, you know, and it's, it's about trusting your gut that, you know, should you, is this the right decision? Um, and, you know, if it doesn't sit well with you, then listen to your gut. Um, so in that, I should never have left this person in that position. They shouldn't have had as many chances as I gave them. And, you know, I should have been bolder in having more, you know, in, in establishing clearer boundaries. So, um, you know, the negative impact on the team was quite significant. And at the end of the day, that was my job as their leader to action that sooner than I did. So um, that's probably my, one of my most recent and probably most raw um, learnings is, you know, it's on you. If you think it's a bad apple, it's on you to go and change it. So um, that's probably, yeah, that's the one. Thank you, Beth. And thanks for being so honest. And it's not easy on a platform like this to go, I'm, yeah, I've made all these mistakes and we all do all the time. And I think ownership and, and kind of coming out, but reflecting and learning from it is, is really all you can do. But that ownership piece is obviously just so important. And look, we've managed to go almost a whole hour without discussing COVID, but, you know, we obviously have to. So, <laughs> um, you know, what are some of your, your leadership strategies been through COVID? You know, I know you have a, you know, high performing sales team. So, you know, what are, you know, some of those strategies that have been useful that other people might be able to take away? I'm not sure any of it's rocket science. I'm sure everyone's probably done the same thing, but I thought, okay, if we've got our sales team and they can't go anywhere and they can't sell anything, then we'll just train the living daylights out of them. So my goal to the team was, you will be the most well-trained and the most knowledgeable sales team once COVID leaves and you know our competitors won't know what's hit them when you are allowed out. So that was the first thing. Um, learning how to motivate people from afar is is a skill that you know we've all had to learn so and you know sometimes it works really well and other times it doesn't um we tried a mix of fun and also education to try and keep people's engagement levels high um and then probably the most challenging for me was um we had heaps of new starters and these were a bunch of caged lions <laughs> Their self-worth and who they are is, is fully dictated by how close they are to smashing their sales number. So these guys are locked in, can't go anywhere. You know, they've come in with all these great ideas. We're all so pumped and, and they just can't do anything. So how do you keep them motivated, on target, on message, and, and not lose that oomph and that hunger. So, um, you know, that was really quite interesting. And, and really, I just kept people focused on when this is over, this is what you will go and achieve. And that's never in any doubt. And all we're doing is shoring up your ability to do that once these restrictions lift. So, yeah. you know, that was a really interesting one to see how difficult it is for, for an individual who's incredibly driven to manage their own drive when they can't let that loose on their customer. Yeah. So that was, that was COVID for us, really. Yeah, no, that's really insightful. And I mean, Casey and I had so many conversations with sales leaders that time around exactly this. And I think it hasn't actually been, you know, rocket science for some companies. And I think, you know, unfortunately, some it, it's fallen flat and for others, it's worked really well. And I think it probably really does come to down to that ownership and that leadership style that kind of makes or breaks people through really challenging circumstances like this. So thank you ever so much, Beth, for your real kind of rawness and honesty. And, and I love that. And look, you know, we've actually managed to hit just on time. That's incredible. So if people do have a bit of time to hang around, if anyone wants to ask any questions, you can unmute yourself now and ask a question or if you prefer to put it in the chat box, great. 
or if people are too shy, it can come afterwards in an email, whatever you, whatever people are comfortable with. Can I just ask a question to Richard, please? So, um, Richard, okay. just with regards to psychometric testing, um, two questions. Um, does it have a place for uh, existing teams as a type of skills development, rather than just to be used as a selection process? Uh, and as an individual, when you're going for a psychometric test, can you prepare for it, or is it really just about what your cognitive ability is, and that's going to become clear as part of the test? And yeah, I, I mean, the, I'll, I'll answer your second question first. You can't really game the tools. You know, they're pretty, uh, they're pretty well built for that. You know, to to kind of cope with that, and also. Um, it actually people people think of it as okay these are the you know these are the behaviors I have to express it's not like that you know there are everyone has strengths and areas for development and you'll know that when you're hiring someone into a business and so you know you'll see you'll and you'll make you make trade-offs you know so it's it's the short answer is is no you can do practice online but it doesn't really that helps you prepare for the actually sitting the the, the test rather than improving your ability um, and as to your second question there's definitely a place for it within teams um, so there are specific tools that can see how a team is going to fit together um, and you can do that before a team is formed or you know when a team is formed we, we see it especially if you've got a team that's not playing so nicely together that they go through psychometric assessments and it's like okay well you've got a team of innovators and no one's actually finishing anything so yes absolutely okay thank you Great question, thank you, Jason. And definitely we've used that kind of Teams format in our recruitment strategy sometimes with companies we partner with that really want to navigate who to add to the team and what the right mix is and improve communication amongst teams. It's, it's been awesome. Yeah. Anybody else? Um. Sorry, I'd like to ask a question if it's okay to go back to Caroline. Um, when you were talking about what you're looking for, Caroline, in terms of, you know, looking for learning agility, looking for EQ um, and looking for that kind of ability and willingness to lead as well, those three factors that you're looking for in a potential leader, um, do you have sort of a structured process whereby you assess those things or is it more of, taking a historical perspective on their performance and a bit of gut feel kind of thrown in for good measure? Yeah, so good question. There's, there's, there's many different things that you can do. So of course the first hand export, uh, what you actually see them do is, is invaluable. But also it's things like, um, there's three things I, I believe that you should be doing also is there's exposure, education and experience. So am I, you know, have I exposed this individual to say, I don't know, an executive meeting, for example, or have I given them a chance to really, to see how they would operate in a, in a different setting? Have I given them a bubble assignment to really see, can they step up and can they operate at that level before I actually say, congratulations, the role's yours. I think that that's a safe space for you to assess someone. But we also do use uh, tools as well to really assess, um, I suppose, potential, mm -hmm. but also where they sit currently versus where they kind of, where they, what their potential might be down the road as well. So there's a combination of both. But I think nothing is quite like putting someone within that actual experience or that exposure to see if they can actually deliver at that level, but it's a safe space. Yeah, right. Thank you. Pleasure. Caroline, there was another question actually for you from the group of questions we collected before today and that was i think it was for you and for beth um what's the best piece in your career journey to date what's the kind of number one best piece of advice that's ever been offered to you big question lots, lots, lots and lots you know i've been blessed i've had so many great mentors in my career along the way but i think the one that always stood out for me is a really young HR practitioner. Not that I'm not young now, let's, let's make that really clear. It's <laughs> your life is your responsibility. And I love that. And it always resonates for me. And, and what I mean by that and how I've really used it is if I want that role, I will, you know, network, I will learn about this. I'll upskill myself. If I, you know, if I want to learn a certain skill set, it's within my control. You know, how I show up every single day, that's me. That's my responsibility. That's on me how I choose to call out a behavior. That's my responsibility, that's on me. So I think it's understanding that I have more control within, uh, with, with what I do versus waiting for people to come and put things 
and give me opportunity. So it's really up to you to really choose where you go with, the, with life, I suppose, in general. Awesome. Thank you, Caroline, for sharing that. And, and Beth, what's the one bit of advice that really kind of stands out for you? Again, uh, lots and lots. Um, <laughs> one was um, I left an organisation and, uh, and, I, and I really enjoyed the, you know, the, the leader. And w when you're leaving, they said to me, you didn't shout loud enough. And so that's something that's always resonated with me is before you make the leap, you know from somewhere you're blissfully happy for what you think might be a great greater opportunity because you think that door is closed for you where you are just make sure you've shouted loud enough that they're aware of this is the direction that you want to go in so that was probably one of the biggest things that's resonated with me is just make sure make sure you're telling everyone what you want to do and make sure that they're listening to you as well because as leaders it's very easy for us to keep people where they are if it's working so, you know, if it isn't broken, we might not fix it, but just make sure that they're aware that that's what you want and, and that's what you, you know, that's what you're going to go for. So if you can't give me that, then don't be surprised if I look somewhere else. Yeah, that's great advice. Definitely, Beth. Thank you. Is there any other questions that anyone has that you could type them into the box or is everybody ready for dinner and a glass of wine? <laughs> I think we might, it might be dinner and a glass of wine. <laughs> well, look, <laughs> well, look, we're really so grateful to everybody on here for joining. And, you know, we, we are, like I said, really passionate about connecting people within the industry. And, and it's not about being competitive, but actually really learning from each other and all contributing to this incredible industry. Thanks again to our um, three guest speakers to Caroline, Beth and Richard. Thank you ever so much for taking the time out. And um, guys, we'll be in touch with you all over the next week or so. And if there's any questions or anyone you'd like to be connected with, then we'll help you to do that. So thank you. Thanks, Tara. Thanks, Tara. Thank Thanks, you. Tara. Guys. Thanks all. Thanks. Bye. See ya. Bye.